As you're able, would you stand for the reading of God's Word? We're in Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 34 through 40. Matthew 22, 34 through 40. But the, when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered themselves together, and as one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for this opportunity to continue to worship you in the word. Lord, as I speak the words prepared, let your Holy Spirit transform them, turn them into the words that we need to hear, Lord, that you might be glorified in heaven and we might be filled here on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So out of Charlotte, North Carolina, there was a lawyer who went and purchased a very rare and expensive box of cigars. He took and he insured those on his way home against fire. (laughs) So over the course of the next month, he began to smoke each and every cigar, enjoying their, um, (laughs) the cigars. He then turned around before he even made his first payment and put a claim into the insurance company to replace the cost of his expensive cigars. Now, the insurance company said, there's no way we're going to do that. He said, but you don't understand, they all expired within small fires. The insurance company refused to pay. They said, this is obviously him trying to uh, cheat the system. And the lawyer said, I'm a lawyer. I'll sue you. And he won. Now, you got to hear what the judge said. The judge said he agreed with the insurance company that the claim was frivolous. The judge stated, nevertheless, that the lawyer held a policy from the company which it had warranted that the cigars were insurable and also guaranteed and that it would insure them against fire without defining what is considered to be an unacceptable fire and was obligated to pay the claim. Yeah, so instead of going back for costly appeals, the insurance company accepted the ruling, paid $15,000 to the lawyer for his loss of the cigars in those small fires. Now the best part. The lawyer cashed the check, and the insurance company had him arrested on 24 counts of arson. (laughs) With his own insurance testimony, he was convicted. 24 months in jail, and a $24,000 fine. (laughs) Lawyers. Excluding some. Lawyers, that's exactly what our scripture text talks about today. The religious establishment got the smartest and the brightest. They brought their lawyer forward to set a trap for Jesus. Verse 34, but when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, don't you love it when Jesus silences someone? They gathered themselves together. They got together. They huddled. You see, every situation that they had thrown at Jesus throughout his ministry was debunked. They couldn't put him into a trap. They tried time and time again. They threw questions at him. They questioned what he was doing. They always were laying traps for Jesus to fall into, and they could not get him. And so they got angry, and they got the smartest one among them, the the lawyer. And they put this plan in place. Now, isn't that what we do when outsiders challenge the status quo? We get together. We've got to stop them. We've got to keep them from doing what they're planning to do. They're going to ruin everything for us. We build an army and we put a plan in place. Now, the Greek word used here for expert in the law is only found, uh, this is the only place it's found in the book of Matthew, and it's nomikos. So, by bringing the lawyer out, they were done playing games with Jesus. It was time to get serious. They are ready to put the trap out and capture Christ in this moment. 
Now, if we look at the Greek, the word used for the test, test in Greek is the very same word used when the devil tested Jesus in the wilderness, parazio. We need to be careful that the enemy's test doesn't become our test in our daily walk against other Christians. Now, I don't doubt that the religious leaders of the day were very devout Jews. They were, they were serious about their faith. They were focused on kingdom things. However, they had allowed sin to enter into their lives and to affect the way that they ruled the Jews. <clears throat> Satan had a hold. He had an influence. So much so that they ignored the true Messiah that was standing in front of them. The ones that they knew all about. They knew the scriptures inside and out. They knew everything about it, yet they missed the Messiah standing right in front of them. You see, that's what Satan does. He focuses on our weakest point in our lives, and he exploits that to cause us to be blind to things. He finds the greatest sinful desire that sleeps deep with inside of us, and he toys with it until we succumb to sin. Speaking of our former, former sinful life, Ephesians 2, 3 states, Among them, we too, all formerly lived, formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. The religious leaders were so entangled in their natural desires for power and for greed, they missed the true Messiah standing before their very eyes. You see, they liked the power. They were in control. They said people did. Do this, don't do that. The people did, and they didn't, depending on what the religious leaders said. They were prestigious. The whole community held them in high esteem. They were very happy where they were. So they asked the loaded question of Jesus, verse 36, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, you have to understand, they had more than 600 laws on the books. 600 laws on the books. And <clears throat> the whole idea is to have Jesus tell them which one is greater than all the others. About 248, I believe, books or laws were about positive commands in correspondence, they say, to the number of body parts. And there were 365 negative commands corresponding to the days of the year. The Jews believed that if someone was to say one law was more weighted than the other law, they were attempting to take on a divine function. So what they were doing is they were asking Jesus to say which law was better than any of the others so that they could then accuse him of being God, which is blasphemy, and they would take the opportunity to throw him in jail. I find it interesting that this debate still rages today. We decide some laws are better than others. We, we decide that if, if you do this sin, it's not near as bad as this sin. Right? We say, we say murder's horrible, yet we destroy people's lives with gossip and lies. Friends, a sin is a sin is a sin in the eyes of God. The Bible does not say any one sin is any worse than another, except for blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said that was the only unforgivable sin. Everything else is sin. It separates us from our desired relationship with God. That's what sin does. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, in essence, is the rejection of Jesus, the rejection of the Holy Spirit, a turning away from an apostasy, if you will, and over my course of time in ministry, I've had many people come up and ask me, or they start, kind of start the conversation, Pastor, I think I've committed the unforgivable sin. And I'm like, okay, well, tell me more. I want to know more. And so they tell me what the circumstance was. They tell me what took place in their life. They tell me why they feel this way. And I have to ask them one specific question. So if you've ever thought you've done the unforgivable sin, this is the answer to that. Do you still feel the Holy Spirit move when you pray to God? When you're in worship, do you feel God moving? And if the answer to that is yes, you have not committed the unforgivable sin because God has not withdrawn his presence from you. This debate, which sin is the worst or what law is the greatest, went on in Jesus' day. 
The Jews again believe that no sin was worse than any other, and so the trap is set. Jesus answered the question. Verse 37, he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. You see, Jesus had already taught his followers the importance of love in the Sermon on the Mount. He'd already engaged his opponents in a lesson about love. Here he is tying it all together with the law. <clears throat> Jesus' statement comes from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. The Jews call it the Shema. The Shema builds on the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, found in Exodus, the 20th chapter, verse 3. But it adds the love requirement. In addition to requiring that we love God, the law also commands in Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9, and these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be a, as frontals on your forehead, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. To fulfill these requirements, Jewish children memorize these verses. And Jewish people wear them in small leather cases on their forehead. They post them on their doorposts and they repeat them day after day in their lives as part of a daily worship, as part of prayer time. If you've ever been on a plane uh, going to Israel out of New York, you're bound to have a lot of um, uh, Jewish people on there that are very strict in their religion. And in the middle of that trip, they will get up at prayer time and they will take this piece of leather that's a little box and it has and they'll put it on their forehead and they'll wrap it around tight and then there's this long thing and they'll wind it around their arm all the way down to the end and they'll hold the end of the leather strap in their hand and that's what they're doing they're praying their daily prayers it's recited daily in worship and it is truly engraven on the jewish hearts no faithful jew can argue with the primacy of this commandment. Now it's interesting too that Jesus says, you're God. This would make this commandment extremely personal. You're to love your God who is present with you always. He knows you. He has a relationship with you. He knows you so well that even he knows the number of hairs counted on your head. You're God. Now, both the Shema and Jesus simply ask us to love God without qualification. With all that we have and all that we are, with all that constitutes the core of our being, our relationship with God is not a place for half-heartedness. It's a place of full surrender to Christ. You see, God doesn't want us to love him superficially. He wants us to give it our all. The reasons marriages fail is because people are half-heartedly invested. Businesses fail because people are half-heartedly invested. Grades in school fail, young people, because you're half-heartedly invested. We cannot go into our relationship with God half-heartedly. It will fail. We have to give an all-out effort with our heart, our soul, and our mind. Every ounce of our being must be in love of God. Jesus continues in verse 39, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. You see, love of God naturally leads to love of neighbor and love of neighbor is part of loving God. We pose the question, who's your neighbor? Is it the person with the house right next to yours? <laughs> yeah, that's a neighbor. But that's not the neighbor the Bible talks about. The neighbor is anybody we come in contact with. You could be in a different city and bump into someone and have a conversation with them. As far as the Bible is concerned, that's your neighbor for the moment. 1 John 4.20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. 
Friends, if we mess up every earthly relationship, how can we expect to get our heavenly relationship right? If you are someone who is always in conflict with earthly relationships, you will never make it in harmony to a relationship with God. Most often, those who are always in conflict with people are those that are stuck in their natural sinful desires. They want it their way more than they want it God's way. And that wanting it my way leads to sin and strained earthly relationships. Leviticus 19, 9 through 18, it really spells out what the Bible says, what God says is loving our neighbor looks like. And it says here, uh, I'll, I'll attach these texts to this so you have an idea. The person who loves his neighbor, verses 9 through 10 says, will not reap the fields bare, but will leave some for the poor. Loving your neighbor is being generous and leaving some for them. Verse 11, will not steal. We don't steal from our neighbors. Will not deal falsely with them. Will not lie to them. Verse 12, will not swear falsely by God's name. Verse 13, will not defraud a neighbor. Will not keep a laborer's wage overnight. Pay him what you owe him. Verse 14, will not revile the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. Verse 15, will not render an unjust judgment. Will not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. Will judge the neighbor with justice. Verse 16, will not engage in slander. Will not profit by the blood of the neighbor. Verse 17, will not hate your neighbor. Verse 18, will not take vengeance or bear a grudge on your neighbor. You say, preacher, you don't know my neighbor. (laughs) I know your neighbor. I've had your neighbor before. Trust me. You can't find one any worse than some of the neighbors we've had. It doesn't say like your neighbor. It says love your neighbor. Love and like are two different things. Like means you don't have to agree with what they're doing or how they're doing it or how they're acting or how they're behaving. Love means you want what's best for them. You want what God wants for them. That's what love's all about. Love is about seeing them with God's eyes, and God wants what's best for every person. The minute that Jesus stated, love your neighbor as yourself, these very laws popped up into the religious leaders' minds because they were trained in the laws. They have them memorized. What do you think about when you hear, love your neighbor as yourself? Do we think about a a love that says, I know you're different than me, but hey, let's be friends. We can work this out. Do we think about a love that says, I care more about you than the TV series I've got to get back to that you're interrupting me from because you knocked on my door? Do we think about a love that says, I know the greatest Savior in the world who loves you too and wants you to be in a relationship with him. I love you so much. Let me share the good news of the gospel message. You see, when we have love of neighbor, it's this overwhelming passion to share Jesus with them. It's a passion that says, you are worth so much and you're so important to me. I want you to be saved too. Our world is full of hurting people who simply need to be loved by those who know what true love is all about. You see, the world tells us what love's about, and that's not God's love. That's lust and greed and power and control. The world will show you all day long what they think love is about. But you and I know different We have a relationship with Christ. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. And we know what love is and how joyful it is and how freeing it is. There is a whole world out here that needs to know about that love. Who will tell them? In our text today, Jesus is saying, All of the laws, all 613 laws hang on those two. Loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and all of our mind, and loving our neighbor as ourself. All the laws hang on those. If we will do those things, everything else will fall into place. 
If we love God with everything we have, then we will follow his commands. We will obey him. We will serve him. And if we love our neighbor, then it puts our relationship in a right place with not just the neighbor, but also with God. A great image here is a door, a two-hinged door, one being the love of God and the other being love of neighbor. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a door before where the hinge was a little loose. When you try to shut the door, what happens? It doesn't shut right, does it? So you've got to kind of lift the door and then push it shut or push down. It just, it just doesn't fit right. Door hinges restrict the motion of the door to the arc in which it was intended to swing. As long as both of those hinges are in place and they're secure, the frame will hold the door and it will function reliably, moving where the creator created it to move. However, if one hinge comes loose, the door becomes an obstruction. It is, becomes useless. Eventually, it'll tear from the frame and fall over. The loss of either hinge, therefore, is tantamount to the loss of both hinges. And there goes the door itself. What happens when a hinge gets loose? You fix it, don't you? You get the screwdriver out, you climb up on a step, and you start to tighten it back down. Maybe you've got to add a little filler in there so it has a better grip, but you you fix it. That's what happens in our relationship, too, whenever we get the love part wrong. We fix it. If our love for God is not where it needs to be, then we fix it. If our love of neighbor is not where it should be, then we fix it and restore the harmony of the hinges. Obedience to the two commandments, to love God and love neighbor, work together to restrict our activity to the straight and narrow path that God intended for us to walk. As long as we observe the the two commandments, we can be confident that we are on a godly path. However, if we choose to ignore either love, we will soon find ourselves in a spiritual ditch, trying to figure out how to get out of it. Now, we often calculate the cost of things, don't we? I'm in the process of adding some uh, light fixtures to the backside of my house, some uh, external outlets so that Piper can be the Griswolds at Christmas. Is it a lie? Not a lie. lie. (laughs) Testify, sister. (laughs) So I put out on, on, on Facebook, I said, hey, I'm looking for an affordable electrician. And everybody chuckles, affordable electrician. (laughs) Ha ha, right? (laughs) I could do it, but it'd be dangerous and the city would shut me down. So I can't do it. Um, I'm weighing the cost, right? I want someone who's good and cheap. I don't want them to be not so good and cheap. So I'll pay for pay. I'll weigh the cost. It has to be done right. Are they licensed? It needs to be right. Did you know that God counted the cost of loving you? God counted the cost of loving you. He knew that we would be disobedient children. He knew the pain that we would bring to him through our relationship with him. He knew the outright rejection that some people would have for him. And yet he decided to love us anyway. A love that says no matter how far you wander, whatever direction you go, I will always be right here for you. The cool part about that is no matter how far you wander, (laughs) he's still right here for you. Wherever you wander, he is there for you. It's a love that says, despite the suffering of my son, I'm going to send him to sacrifice for you. It's a love that says, my love is stronger than your sinful desires. And our only response to that is to accept his love and live our lives in pursuit of his will for our lives. That's not an easy task, yet it's one that he will help you live out. 
He will help you live that task out if you'll seek Him with all of your love, with your heart, with your soul, with your mind, and if you'll love your neighbor as you love yourself. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you so much for the love that you have for us. Lord, we thank you for sending your son to sacrifice on our behalf. Lord, never let us take that for granted. Lord, help us to be a mindful people. Lord, empower us to reciprocate that love to those around us so that they see you through us. In Jesus' name, amen.